Jovana, jedno pitanje. Obzirom na broj ljudi u sali, ja ću švenkovati isključivo kada se budu postavljala pitanja. Neću ju suprotno držati. Da. Mogu da pređem na njih dok ti govoriš, daj da se vratim. So, just for our panelists, I will give a short introduction in Serbian and then I will go to English just for your information. Hvala vam svima što ste došli, evo počinjemo ovaj panel koji se odnosi na zelene transformacije u polju pozorišta. Ja ću sad odmah da se prebacim na 
na, na sesiju na engleskom i a, m, samo kratka informacija posle ove sesije imamo prezentaciju prilično kreditnog kubatora u polju izvođačkih umetnosti u pogledu zajedne informacije jedan, i onda jedan veoma važan panel o policiju a, koji se odnosi na model, mogućnosti oblikovanja politika a, u kontekstu klinijske krize i polju umetnosti i kulture i a, poslednji panel se odnosi na mlade glasove, odnosno one koji a, su stvaraoci, a već imaju iskustva u radu sa ekološkim držim praksama i temama koje se tiču prirodnog okruženja. So, hello to everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this um, insightful session where we will delve uh, into the intersection of arts and uh, culture uh, with the pressing issue uh, of uh, climate crisis. Uh, our discussion will center on the profound role of performing arts in this context, as well as the criticalism between arts and culture and climate justice. Additionally, we will explore the concept of sustainable theater and how we can define it, particularly in terms of work procedures, production practices, uh, uh, the further our commitment to a more sustainable future. We will also address the question of how we can make theater production more environmentally aware, considering uh, materials, uh, life cycle, afterlife, uh, and a lot of other topics in this uh, context. And finally, we will seek to provide practical guides, um, some tools, and share good practices when it comes to the uh, sustainable theater production. I'm super happy that we have our panelists here today. Thank you for, for all of you for uh, participate uh, uh, in uh, our panel uh, uh, who are coming from different global contexts um, uh, and I'm happy to welcome and introduce uh, colleagues, theater professionals with a large experience uh, in this field, um, uh, Ian Garrett, Adam Marple, uh, Heron Yi, uh, Mikhaila Rigorova and uh, Nadia uh, Fistero. Um, I look forward to engaging discussion, uh, filled with, uh, with uh, valuable insights, uh, innovative solutions, and other ideas uh, that we would like to share today. Uh, so again, thank, thank you for joining us, and let's begin, uh, begin this conversation uh, about transformative power of uh, arts and culture in the scope of climate crisis and all other issues that we are facing with, within this context. Uh, just uh, for a short uh, technical information before we start, uh, uh, each of our uh, panelists will have five minutes uh, to share their perspective on of this uh, uh, little topic, uh, uh, introduce their work, uh, their practices, uh, uh, organization, research, and then we will continue with the uh, question and discussion within the rounds. So thanks again for, for uh, being with us today. So I will uh, ask uh, Misha to uh, start. Thank you, Misha, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Michaela Rigrova, in short, Misha. I... Uh... I'm interested in this theme since 2007, uh, when I was uh, just a student of uh, production at theater faculty at Academy of Performing Arts. Uh, at this faculty, I'm currently teaching ecology and sustainability in theater. And I just recently started also teach at the film faculty of the same university uh, with the green filming. I'm a manag production manager of the information platform in Czech Republic greenfilming.cz. And uh, I look into this perspective really from the point of sustainability, which is uh, which concerns all the three main pillars, which is uh, social, economical, and environmental. So I don't push just the environmental part, but uh, I would like everyone to uh, think about the two other really important pillars which make it whole. That would be it for me. Thank you. For the beginning, thank you. Uh, and Nadia, can you ask you uh, to share with us your position? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. 
Uh, I'm Nadia Pistarol and I uh, live in Zurich. Um, I am stage designer and costume designer as well. And I work for, I don't know, the last, I don't know how many years, 15, 20 years as stage designer. And um, I am in Zurich at the ZHRK teaching their stage design. Um, and I'm the, the head of the stage design studies uh, in Zurich. So, um, and my approach is more that um, I really saw the opportunity on one hand to, to work in theater and at the, uh, at the same time also teach uh, to, uh, to, to be really uh, on a joint where you can bring informations together. And so um, I started with a friend of mine. Uh, we started to um, make this uh, website called Stuff New Material Cycles for Theater. And there we just try to collect uh, knowledge. Uh, on one hand, it's uh, it's um, you can find there a lot of materials that are um, that are really good uh, to use in theaters, like alternatives to use, but also new systems or um, new thoughts about how uh, circularity can function. Uh, but also, uh, we also um, recommend uh, literature and, and and things like that because I think it's not only about um, or uh, let's say. Um, um, be as a, like acting more sustainable also means uh, thinking in another way uh, about uh, the world itself. So um, it's not just about practical um, things, but also about uh, uh, finding a new philosophy somehow. And that is uh, one thing I'm doing. And another thing uh, we have um, launched a website really short time ago. It's called uh, Mining Map Zurich. Uh, that's not only for theaters, but it's also for art uh, artists, art students, um, whatever. And then we um, we just look at the at the city um, as a mine. It means like uh, we just try to to look for all the materials that are leftovers from industry or from theaters and so on. And there, that's where we. Um, that's where we try as so we just like mark all these points and then uh, people who want to work can really um can they, they can really uh, have an access to all these uh, materials that are uh, uh, leftovers or already used material and so that is a tool it's now we have we may now money map Zurich but uh, it's a digital tool that we can hand over to all other art universities so that means I don't know we have now a Cologne uh, Berlin and um, Vienna as well, and Rome. Uh, these uh, four cities are already interested to uh, to um, also have one of these mining maps. So that is like my research, <laughs> my, my focus. Uh, thank you, Nadia. And I would like to ask all of you when you are mentioning uh, some organization or projects, just put the, 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 the websites or, or something in the chat after for, for the colleagues that you can, uh, after the conference, share with our uh, participants. Um, so, Ian, the floor is, the Zoom floor is yours now. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Ian Garrett. Um, I uh, am awake at 4 a.m. in Toronto, where I'm based. I um, I have a couple of different relevant hats here. I uh, uh, noting institutional affiliations. Uh, I teach ecological design for performance at York University uh, here in Toronto. Uh, I'm also director of, and it's external to the university, the Center for Sustainable Practice in the Arts, which has been uh, formally working in this space since about 2008, uh, when we started bringing a number of different projects under one one banner. Uh, the the work of the CSPA uh, takes on, as as you're hearing from a number of of the guests, takes on a few different facets, not just focused on the eco efficiency and footprinting and environmental aspects of sustainability when it comes to art production, which is a, a, a large part of what we do, where the, ho the can we, we host the Canadian version of the Creative Green Tools, which is the Joyce Bicycle uh, footprinting platform. And we work with um, our governments and, and different public funders across Canada to uh to to 
have their fundees, those who are receiving grants and support, uh, be able to use that to get a picture of what's happening here in this country. Uh, but I often refer to that as a, as a bit of our Trojan horse in which we're getting the conversation of sustainability happening within uh, arts organizations and with, um, with artists who are uh, trying to consider this practice and what they're doing. So we also do a lot of uh, uh, leadership and, and literacy training around that, running a large number of workshops. And to projects, we have a project called the Department of Utopian Arts and Letters, which is inviting artists to create a syllabus for their imagined futures uh, past the climate cr crisis, uh, sort of as a performative open source class. Uh, we're also the co, uh, I'm co-director and we, we, with the Arts Climate Initiative in the US, run the Climate Change Theater Action Festival, where every other year, um, including one who will come shortly uh, uh, thus far. Uh, uh, international playwrights are invited to uh, or commissioned to write short climate change plays, which are then made freely available for anyone in the world to be able to use. And we're happy to say that uh, we have representation in the past of all, uh, of all continents uh, and have been able to commission uh, 25 uh, short climate change plays, uh, which uh, the, that festival right now is running, so I'll put links into the chat after after I do the introduction uh, that where one could join that if you'd be interested in the purpose of those being uh, to make it useful for others to uh, to start to integrate this into their programming and what they're working on. And then uh, we do a large number of uh, we do a lot of consulting um, where we work with a number of different universities. I spent. Uh, yesterday with the University of Waterloo here outside of Toronto, but in the greater area, um, working on how to examine their processes and their training mechanisms for being able to uh, uh, train the artists who are going to be do joining the field uh, in how to integrate this into what they're doing and also to prepare them for the, the tools that we've been working with our with deploying uh, with our funders and governments uh, here in Canada. And we do a number of publications as well. So we, re we, we report on that consulting and uh, trying to create engaging ways to get that information out there and also release a, a quarterly publication and individual artist reports so that we're, we're moving the, the work around. And my own work is as an eco-sonographer uh, working on integrating ecological and eco-critical ways of thinking into design for performance and uh, and for spatial design. Uh, so looking at how that impacts the way that we use resources and the way that we, we collaborate with our, our non-human collaborators of space and integrate circularity into what we're doing sort of, uh, in the vein of uh, Tanya Beer's work. In eco sonography, uh, which is also part of the the teaching I do at York, and that's yeah. that's me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ian, um, and thank you for all these uh, uh, in initiatives and uh, all of your efforts uh, that you are putting in this in this field. And also, it is important to mention that this network is also the network that we uh, that you initiate. Uh, with the practitioners from the field is very important for all of us around the world who are, who are in it uh, just to have idea what is uh, going on and also to connect each other and that was the opportunity for us also to um, see how how in different global context, context is this, uh, this thing is uh, developing or, or, or going and uh, to connect each other. So thank you for that and your efforts on this side. Uh, Adam uh, Marco uh, also um, uh, in different projects that he will mention um, now and share with us. Yes, hello, thank you, good morning. Uh, I too am joining uh, from <laughs> the other side of the planet is 4 a.m. for me as well. So if I end up being incomprehensible, uh, we will know why. Uh, following Ian as articulate as you were this morning. <laughs> uh, We'll see. Uh, so hello, my name is Adam Marple. Uh, I'm assistant professor of directing at American University in Cairo. I'm also the co-artistic director of the Theater of Others and for why I, I imagine all, why I'm here this morning, the founder of the Sustainable Theater Network. Um, I'm late to this 
uh, I'm late to thinking about sustainable theater practices until about two years ago. Uh, I, I've always considered myself a minimalist director, and that is that comes through in my um, my queries to designers, my uh, use of space, my asking for things, uh, but not actually thinking about it in terms of an actual practice of sustainable theater. I came across this uh, as I was invited to work on uh, artistic initiatives around COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt last year. And as we were working towards creating the work, we were having international writing workshops and uh, short stories were created with this, uh, books, paintings, all kinds of out uh, outlooks and outreach of projects were happening. And uh, I was asked to create a theatrical piece and I thought, yeah, this is fantastic. All of the, the output and energy that's going into this and yet I'm going to create something ephemeral that is going to use a lot of materials. And we're also going to tour. And also it's going to be at this gigantic festival conference where people are going to be flying in every two minutes from all around the world. Um, and I started thinking that the stories themselves were ecological in focus, as, as uh, Ian was just saying with uh, climate change theater action the 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 pieces the piece that i was working on was all ecologically focused um and i needed to think of how to uh make it that way as well uh, and there are a ton of resources out there so many resources so many amazing people working on this and i didn't know them and i didn't know where to find them and just doing a, a google search came up with some things but you know i think i'm a pretty smart guy and pretty resourceful and i just didn't know where to begin and i just didn't know what to do do i buy led lighting and then do what with it <laughs> plug it into a grid do i go and recycle costumes or do i just use what we always have had you know all those questions that every young theater maker goes through and as the steps get harder and harder and harder they give up more and more and more and uh it was a it was a really interesting process for me to kind of go through and really go this is what i want to be doing this is what i need to be doing um so out of cop 27 came the sustainable theater network um and we want to be a wikipedia page an open source uh place where we can share that work not the resources everybody's i mean you know green theater book sustainable uh, production toolkit all these amazing people doing this great work, but where can we actually show the work? Where can we actually show um, that we're not, you know, just making plays with trash bags and tires? We're actually being as aesthetically beautiful as we have always been, just thinking about it in a different way. Uh, so we've partnered with uh, 15 plus universities around the world to, over this next COP28 year, to produce a production that they say is sustainably made and then have the director, the designer, the dramaturg come and explain what, what they did, what choices they made, what were they successful in, and what they failed at. Because I think it's important for us to all recognize that trying and not succeeding is still a step forward, and that we need to know what we tried to do and what we didn't come across because we can learn from that. The next person that watches that production hears that dramaturg talk about, you know, in week four, a week before we were going into tech, we had to cut blah, blah, blah. We know this. We know this as designers and directors and theater people. Shit happens. Excuse me, my French. It, it, it happens. And we have to make really tough decisions along the way. And it, we need to talk about the vision that starts it so that we have you know the mission statement that every theater company has what are we not going to go against what are we going to fight for what are we going to go to the mat for every single time and then what is the thing that we can let go and go not this time but next time so thank you thank you thank you Adam, for this uh, introduction and uh, questioning a lot of um themes that are important to us. Uh, and I'm giving now the floor to Hyman. Thank you, Hyman, for being with us. Hi, uh, my name is Hyman. Uh, I'm from, I'm a theater maker from South Korea, but I'm connecting from Halifax, Canada. So it's uh, also 5, 27 a.m. now. So <laughs> please understand if I'm also a bit out of nowhere. 
Um, I'm running a theater company called Blooming Buddhas, which is a participatory theater company. And we explore sustainability and climate justice through playfulness and community engagement. We started our theater company in London, UK in 2015, and we've uh, worked across um, Korea and Canada and other places in the UK. Um, the reason we started our company was because we wanted to break down this huge issue of climate crisis to something we can um, understand and something we can kind of break down to chewable chunks and to um, go through it without being overwhelmed. So it was like, I was not really expert in environment at all. And we didn't really imagine our future will be um, like more difficult with climate issues that time, like back in 2015. So we are grateful that we went through these um, many years to understand and work and share different voices uh, in tackling climate issues. Um, and we started during the pandemic, we started the series of informal um, talk sessions called Climate Justice Tea Time, which invite uh, artists from different places and open to any anyone who engages with art to come and talk about their um, concerns, sometimes eco-anxiety and some of the questions that they are going through. And as Adam said, like, we don't really know where to start often. Even there are so many resources, many people find those uh, resources are sometimes not very accessible, especially from non-English speaking country. We have like huge um, gap between these language and resources. So our tea time is trying to connect these empty spaces and trying to make this conversation and discourses more open to different places. I am also a member of Korean initiative, which means from today in Korean. Uh, we started about two years ago and because we found uh, many Korean artists had difficulties having access to those resources and where to start when they want to uh, start making transition in their work in climate crisis. So we started from translating Theatre Green Book from the UK into Korean. And we are running workshops with diverse groups, including a Seoul Fringe Festival. Uh, our members are um, some theatre maker and performance maker like me, and also producers and dramaturg. And we are also trying to extend our network in East and Southeast Asian artists to discuss sustainable practice together, which uh, is always like different in every uh, local areas. Um, yes, uh, my, I'm, also, I'm also a PhD student, but my research is about decomposition and our inter interconnectedness within the planet. And I'm exploring it through our relationship with fungi, but I'm not going too deep with mushrooms today. <laughs> So that's me for now. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you all for this uh, early waking up that I didn't mention before. Uh, in Turkey, it's also morning, but not so early as, 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 as your places around the, the globe. Uh, so we can start now with the, with the questions that are we are going to the round, with the, within the rounds. Uh, so the first one is what uh, arts and culture bring into the dialogue of climate crisis, uh, the role of, of performing arts in this context, uh, um, arts and culture in general within the dialogue of climate crisis. You already mentioned some of your position on this uh, topic, but maybe we can go now more deeper into it. So we can, we can we can follow the the road that we already uh, started with uh, Misha. Okay, thank you. 
um you know when i uh started uh thinking about uh sustainability uh in theater it was really from a production place so it was more about money and wasting uh because that's how i became interested i saw after one a uh, huge exhibition just the material being wasted and thrown away and I was like me and my other friends students don't have money for the materials we we need to actually make our art and here there are containers and containers of new things which were used for a week thrown away and so I came from a production point of view and money point of view and then as I was learning more and more, I became really idealistic. And I thought that like, oh, theater can save the world. Let's show everyone. And and as I learned more and more, I was like, <clears throat> well, let's not use theater this way. Let's let's keep a theater and let's keep art and uh, art. And I realized that the huge potential of art and why art should stay art and not be just a messenger of crisis and all these things is because art and its power is uh, that it can give us the historic context and give us like richer and broader perspective of the of our actions and of actions of others. And uh, it also help us to see beyond the limits of our existence now in the moment in very limited space and time. Um, it also can train our empathy and help us to put us in shoes of others, uh, to see things and other ideas through eyes of other person. Um, and uh, and Last and but not least, it is it it can help us and and give us kind of a feeling of belonging, uh, unite us that uh, show us that we are not alone in this and that we are not facing the crisis and whatever is going on in the world alone. And I think that these three things are really the main power of art, and that's how we should utilize it and use it in in this crisis let's let's keep it art but let's have in mind that the art can do all of this and help us uh help us in this situation thank you misha i see that uh hi on uh, uh there's a fan on the window so please um i Definitely agree with Misha. Um, I think that the one of the biggest value of performing arts is that it's a practice of sharing time and space with others, and it's an art, um, coming out from people's relationships. So, um, more than any other art forms, I think like performing arts have been, um, talking a lot about how to work together to make our uh, practices more in a sustainable way so it's not only about materials but it's really about how we reflect on like our previous relationships with any like with the audience with our collaborators our uh, staffs and anyone like, engaged with our artist practice so it's really we can only go through this through our relationships and I think that's just built the basis of all the efforts and practices we need for climate to tackle the climate issues I think and as Misha said like it's about belonging it's about empathy and to uh, rephrase that for me like it's it's all about sending invitation what kind of invitation we can send to the world, what kind of invitation we can send to the audience. And my practice with my theater company, Blooming Ludus, started from that perspective, how we can invite the audience to this overwhelming issues. And it kind of feels like we need these resources. We need 
uh, understanding, like, for example, like, how do we know if LED light will help? Is, this, is it a science? Is it social practice? Where should we approach from? And our practice started from the fact that we also don't really know so many things and we wanted to bring some playfulness so people can make uh, find this journey more fun because this will be like a long-term process one resource cannot just magically change everything there's always time for negotiation and discussion and as adam said just before like we can fail, but it's okay. It's always try and reflect and then trying again. So I really want to celebrate that journey through performing art together. Thank you very much. Nadia, do you have some ideas? Of course you have, but would you like to share with us? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, for me, it's also, um, it's also what Michelle said, maybe it's not only about talking about the crisis all the time, but uh, I still think that we have to take over responsibility and maybe really with working differently, I think the aesthetics will change. And it's not everything so slick and shiny and maybe there are faults in it, maybe there are signs in and paths in it that uh, the material went through before. And so I think it's also somehow about... Um, like it, uh, establishing maybe new aesthetics or new new um, expectations maybe it's also that we can uh, shape that a bit like the expectations of uh, of the public and of ourselves like what uh, what we want to see on stage and maybe also it does not have to be every time something new maybe it's really beautiful to see something a couple of times but different and I think we, we maybe um that that is what uh, what I think we can establish, and also um, about um, I think we are we are also as artists we are researchers, but in a very special way. That my, I, I really think that we we are capable of thinking connections new, of uh, finding new paths, of making different connections. Maybe also scientists can do that, but I think we can do that as well, uh, in, in our way, and. Um, and I think that is really the, uh, and, and I think um, maybe by doing it, not by talking about it all the time, but by doing it, I'm, I'm sure that um, that it will spread also, that uh, it will have its impact uh, on the people being, um, as, as you have once said, like the people sharing the space with us, the audience sharing the space with us. So I think it's about uh, like finding new ways and new aesthetics. That is what we can do. Yeah, we are talking actually about the no, new paradigms uh, within the aesthetics, but also within working procedures that are important to, to be merged. Then we come to, to new aesthetic philosophies in, within our work. So, Ian, can you reflect on this? Uh, what arts and culture bring to the dialogue of climate crisis and how we can uh, see the role of performing arts within it? I'll, I'll sort of uh, reduce it to sort of like two, two ideas that sort of, uh, that become the core of our approach. One is uh, is more broadly inclusive of the performing arts, but that at this point within the climate crisis, where we have uh, plentiful evidence of the uh, like objective evidence about the impacts of human activity on the environment. And we have significant amounts of information about any number of ways in which we could be mitigating the negative impacts and negative outcomes caused by that, that what prevents us from fixing things is ultimately will and human decisions too. So ultimately the climate crisis at this point is a cultural problem. And so we need to use culture uh, to be able to shift uh, what we're doing in society. And, and in parallel to that, specifically in performance and, and, and sort of the, what made me excited about, like just as a, as a 
whether or not it's through the the initiatives or through my own work, is sort of thinking about the way that we relate to each other, our relationships. There, there's no sort of natural law as to outside of our our constructs of how we want to put together society and civilization as as to how we how we work. And so uh as someone who is a, a theater and performance scholar i read that and i hear that it's uh um society is a performance and so if we want to change society we should be able to use performance to reimagine what we would like it to be so uh, it's a cultural issue ultimately that's where we are in the crisis and i i personally think that using performance to reimagine and remodel uh the the world we want to be in uh, is uh, the most exciting way to do that. Yeah, very, very inspiring thoughts about all these, about all these topics. And Adam, can you add some of your ideas? Certainly, yeah. Um, I think uh, Nadia said something that really sparked a thought. So. Just bear with me for a second as I kind of take this in a little tangent, I will bring it back around. I, I, I was thinking about the authentic and that which cannot be faked. And after a year of us being introduced, the public being introduced to AI and a large swath of at least the American uh, theater and film uh, system has been questioning, you know, the, uh, the role of AI and all of this, I was thinking, yeah, maybe we don't need to be doing new things. We need to go back to what makes theater theater. Um, it, it cannot be faked. It's going to be the only thing that we're going to be able to go, oh, right. Yes, that actually happened. I was there. I saw that. Anything else outside of that context, we're not going to know anymore. And it's only going to get worse, obviously. Um, we, we, are going to, we are going to end up being, I'm hoping, I think, I've always thought, we're going to end up being integral in a lot of things because it is going to be the only place where we are we are connecting again and i'm not just saying connecting in terms of theater a play i'm thinking in in terms of as as ian is saying a society we we need to we love we know this we love community we want to be together um it's the only place that anything actually happens anymore um so sorry that's the tangent i'm bringing it back around because um i agree yeah. Yes, we are like scientists and I have spent an inordinate amount of time with scientists in the last two years at these cops and working with them and um, we, we are not opposite of them. We are, we, we're using virtually the same skills. You don't understand how many scientists also play an instrument, also are interested in the arts. It's just their brain went a different way and our brain went a different way and we kind of stopped doing those things together. But I imagine we were all very inquisitive and inventive uh, in school when we were younger, because nobody had defined for us that science and art were not the same thing. Um, scientists are curious, they're patient, they're open, they're collaborative. I could have just described any one of us in any of our fields. Um, last year's COP, uh, the head of Greenpeace uh, said something after one of our performances, and he says, I've been coming to COP for 15 years. And, um, you know, 15 years ago, it was the climate scientist saying, we've got to turn around, we've got to turn around, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, oh my God, oh my God. And then, of course, nobody listened. And then about five to seven years ago, the climate activists, the Greta Thunbergs of the world showed up and they said, we've got to change this, we've got to change this, shame on you, how can we do this, how can we do this? And nobody listened. And he said, I think it's time for the artists to come here and start actually talking to us because... It is about the empathy, as, as Misha was saying. It is, it is about connecting with the hearts. It's about a cultural shift. It is about, um, it, we're not changing minds. The, the, the science is there, as he was saying. Like, nobody's disagreeing with this. I mean, there are people disagreeing with this, and unfortunately, they're in power. But really, nobody's disagreeing with this. But, yeah, that seems really hard. No, oh, I don't know. Life is convenient now. Um, that's the, you're right, that's the problem. And so really getting an emotional connection to what this is, who this is happening to around the world and knowing that after this crazy year that we all had with the climate, with weather and everything else, like how can you not be affected by this now? Everybody, 
on the planet was affected by some crazy wackadoo weather we had, some crazy wackadoo climate that we can't, we can no longer rely on and know what next year's gonna be, when the hurricane season will happen, what El Nino will do to us this year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other part of that is with empathy that we can do as well is climate despair is a real thing. All of us who work in this, we, we, I imagine we all have suffered from it, uh, find people who suffer from it. And um, I think keeping that hope alive, uh, as I can't remember who said this before, but talking about the future that you want to happen, what happens on the other side of this? What happens if we do, if we succeed? Let's say we, we succeed. Um, and let's also talk about if we fail. But getting past that, getting the climate despair to keep us from even taking a step forward. That's, uh, that's where, that's where theater, that's where community, that's where all performing arts really kind of are really going to excel in the 21st century going forward. Now, I think that's, I think that's where we're, where we're needed more than anything else. Do, do you have some, yeah, Nisha, please reflect before another question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to comment on a few things which are actually now nicely coming together. It's, um, uh, uh, recently, I've seen a short uh, video, like a video uh, recording of a uh, talk, what is the effective climate content? And Professor Denise Baden uh, from, of, like, she's a professor of sustainable practice at the University of Southampton. And she said that there, there are studies showing and proving that uh, showing the, the crisis, only showing and like showing the disasters, that doesn't really motivate people to change but showing the good examples and showing the future uh, as uh, both Ian and Adams uh, like talked about is what is actually changing people's behavior and is initiating the action and that is important um, and I want to connect it with like one interesting thing like in green filming like we did a little research here in Czech Republic just to start with something to have some numbers and we asked 140 uh, members of Czech Producers Association and the third of them replied and to our it I think it was biggest surprise for us because when we ask what is the biggest struggle on the way to incorporate the sustainable practices and the green practices, we thought every like everyone will answer on, or put on first place finances. And it was only second because the first one was unwillingness of people to change. And uh, which is really interesting and uh, eye-opening because I thought we are over that, that people actually want to do things and then we talked about it a little bit more and even what was already said here it is sometimes people just don't understand like what sustainability is really about and that it and they kind of miss out on the thing it's about thoughtfulness frugality of course but responsibility and the responsibility is something people, I think, miss out on. And uh, it's almost it almost seems like they think somebody else is responsible, like they are waiting for somebody else to bring rules or uh, give us step by step like things, uh, step by step list how to do things. But uh, it's our own responsibility to actually make steps to decide to start. And um, so that was my, my kind of addition to what, what we talked about and mentioned before. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. It is, of course, our individual responsibility, but also a systematic one. Uh, if we are putting that in a systematic framework, we are coming then to the question of sustainable theater and possibilities of organization or our initiatives to transform and uh, how we are defining it in a terms of work procedures. We, and then we will come to the question of uh, theater production in terms of materials. But before that, how we can implement production processes in, uh, within our 
uh, the framework of uh, performing arts within organization and uh, institutional practices or, or our, um, yeah, our individual work. Uh, so that is the second question for, for all of you. Um, why sustainable theater? How we can define it in terms of working procedures or production processes? It is, it, before we start, it is a, a big uh, effort that uh, all of you are giving in, in that sense and uh, individuals and professionals around the world, but uh, in a sense of uh, um, answering the culture and the field of performing arts, it is not something that is systematically changing. So um, can you explain a bit more how you see this uh, transform transformative uh, 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 possibilities of, uh, of, of green transformation within ticket performing arts. Oh, well, I, I, will, I will start in, in our round. And um, for me, the question is not why sustainable theater, it is why not? Why not sustainable theater? Sustainable theater is something which will keep the theater alive and going and for the future, which will, will preserve it for the future. So why wouldn't we want to do that? That's, or that, that's the real so question. Or, or why it is so hard to implement it? <clears throat> um, what I've seen from my practice and talks I had with theaters and other professionals, it is uh, misunderstanding what it actually is. And it is not explaining why we do it and uh yeah why we why we do it um because we have all these manuals how to do stuff but uh we are not usually or the theaters are usually not really explaining like why the things should change because the processes in place are in place for decades and uh it is also because it's not explained and uh, there is no why it's only you have to do this like this. Uh, people are scared. They fear. They don't understand. You can imply rules, but if people don't understand what is behind the rules, they will just obey like sheep. And in the first convenient moment, they will skip. They will make some, uh, some you know, uh, work around. Uh, but if they understand what it is, why is it doing and what it brings, what it brings to them and that it's not endangering them, that it's, uh, then it, it's different thing. Um, I saw, especially in the theater field, people are overworked. They don't have time. They don't have capacity. They are not paid well. And this is a huge problem in implementing any sustainable processes because it seems like a lot of more work and that they already like work for two people. So will they now work for three people for like third, the money they actually need for a living. So it's very complex. And for me, the, like one of the most important things, if you want to implement um, any sustainable processes is actually talk with people look at the capacity, don't forget the social aspect of sustainability, don't forget the economics uh, economics in it and, and figure it out from this side. So people don't fear, they understand why they are doing what they are doing and there is fair compensation and there is actually capacity to follow through on the plans and on the work. So I would open this like like this, and others uh, can dip in yeah. with their other practical things from from their fields and theaters. Then then we will reflect to, to each other. Um, yeah, it is it is also I think a, a question of um, uh, advocating and the policies within the uh, cultural policies, and then the policies within the performing arts that are not applying this. Uh, questioning the, the the working practices, but uh, yeah, we will continue now with Nadia. And what are your thoughts about it? I think, like the first thing I said before, uh, we have this uh, this habit, or we had that for a long time, that we have an idea, and then no matter what, we just like make material choices uh, and uh, just to 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 somehow bring that idea to life as perfect as we can. 
And I think um, to to work a bit different on one hand to to get inspired by what is there or just to open your eyes and see what is there and what uh, what potential does that have and what can I do with these things that is uh, for me a first step or a really I, I also have to train myself right now uh, to rethink that a little bit and um, that uh, there again it comes uh, that of course we find other materials than we we're looking for but I don't know maybe it does something with me it's an interesting path as well designing with the things that you've found already and um I think the other thing is that uh, um, is to to really um, you said uh, to to be responsible, and I think we should never ever stop being responsible, even if we don't believe in it. We still have to be responsible. Uh, I think that is uh, really important, and I think uh, may, maybe I would like to draw it even one step further. Uh, I think we. Um, we are not only responsible, we are somehow, I, I started feeling responsible for the material I use, or I, I'm the guardian somehow. It's like, uh, if I cannot get it from somewhere where it, it is used, it has been used before, then I have to, if I get something new, I'm, I'm responsible for where it goes to afterwards. And, and somehow it's a really a, a complete different connection to, to material in a way. And I think, uh, artists do that and I think also I, I've had the experience that some of the workshop people also started thinking with you in that way so um, that is a, quite a beautiful movement uh, that is one thing and then um, there's another thing I, I know Michaela you said like uh, price and uh, like money and and um, and uh, and time is really rare but uh, still I think um, it's uh, if, if you have um, if you say, okay, that's not ecological, but it costs more, then say, I say, yeah, but doesn't matter. Then it costs more than I take less. It's it's a reason. It's not just a would be nice, but it's a reason to to not do it or to to do it differently or rethink it. Um, an ecological, yeah, you know, what I what I said before. I think these are the 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 paths. Um, I think is important to follow in in really producing uh, stage design or theater. Yeah. Thank you, Nadia. And then, what can yeah, you say about? It, it, I don't have to, too much to to add to the perspective that 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 you should not even bring uh, to that. I think that ultimately. Like the resistance to change is about resistance to changing how you work and the resistance to changing what you're making. And people are not necessarily comfortable with one of those choices. And oftentimes I, I find in theater, a lot of that has to do with, as was indicated, that, that people don't have uh, capacity, they don't have the time, uh, et cetera. And not to say that somebody is discounting it there, but then it becomes risky or people uh, who have a, a way of working that allows them to, to work within that capacity to be able to realize the, the work that they've become comfortable in being able to realize for that, um, trying to insert change into that process uh, will, will have resistance if there's untested ways of working. And so I think a lot of the responsibility for those of us who are uh, committed to this uh, action, and I think that's more and more people uh, is to to work to make that that those shifts more comfortable. Or, well, there there's sort of two perspectives uh, or two stages that I know that it exists in the projects and work that I do. Uh, one is this idea of the permeable institution that you know you can't force people to change anymore; that they're willing to change. So focusing on the areas where they're comfortable. Um, with change happening, uh, not to say that they're avoiding change, but just to focus on the areas where there is the most potential uh, for for change to build comfort with what those changes are so that they can see that it's not so scary. Uh, and to, uh, to, to work at examining those processes that gets them to stretch enough uh, so that they're practicing that, that muscle of reevaluating conventional practices that they may have just had embedded through years, even decades of working 
uh, that they they're they're resistant to, and so there there's that that aspect um, of meeting meeting that resistance, uh, and you know, and then with the work that is being created and sharing that uh, sharing that information and providing those case studies is the more that I think folks realize that there is potential here. And I, I really, you know, jumping off of what, what Nadi was just saying, that there is the creative potential too of what can be created um, based off of having these different ways of integrating our values into the way that we're working. And so while it can be, I find people can be very resistant um, to changing the way that they're working because um, we don't have room for failure in a lot of what we're doing. Um, it's very difficult because we feel very responsible to getting things open and and out there when we say that they would for the audience that is expecting to come in, um, regardless of whether or not that's felt or real. But if we can find the places where we can start the shift, future shift become easier and if there's a reflection there of both the success there and then the creative potential and what we can discover there, I find that that uh, those sort of like that sort of approach of uh, generosity of realizing that we have sort of uh, abundance and not to treat it as though we're trying to take something away from somebody, but that they were creating new opportunities for something that they can and 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 building comfort with that that um, that that makes the shift exciting it makes it about inventing as opposed to what am i not allowed to do anymore and that sort of mind shift mind shift mindset shift this is the that's the 5 a.m talking uh is uh is, is key regardless of which department that 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 you're working with Adam? Yeah, uh, just picking up right where Ian left off the scarcity mindset versus the abundance mindset. I think we talked about this in the international uh, meetup last time of of really, I mean, <laughs> we're theater artists, we, we have lived with a scarcity mindset since, since we began this entire process, but it's embedded itself in there. And we've just, we're poor starving artists who never have enough time and never have enough money my god we've got a space and we've got people who want to come and hear us do something that that's a that's a mind shift that's a change right there that's easily transferable over to going and we're only going to use this table that we found someplace else and we're only going to use that right it's like sustainable theater there's a perception that it's it's hard and it's not sexy and that's what we're battling a lot of the times is it's hard, so I don't want to do it because I'm going to lose something instead of gaining and becoming inventive. And it's not sexy because uh, I'm going to talk about the earth and volcanoes and dinosaurs. Like, what? No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about whatever else we're already talking about just <laughs> right now going forward and how we can move forward with that. I think there's, um, I'm a director not a designer. Um, and so my solutions are not going to be the majority of the panel solutions, uh, because I don't have the skill set, I don't have the the resources, and the knowledge uh, of how to how to do that. But I'm a director, I set the vision. And I think um, having having a company vision, having a production vision, having a rehearsal vision, is an incredibly important thing. I think we know what rehearsal is, so we just jump into it. We know what the design process is, so we just jump into it. And we, and, and I'd love to take the time to actually kind of do, like um, Theater Ghent uh, has, uh, did something, a manifesto. That was an impossible thing that they, that, there's no way possibly that they could do that, but the reach for that. I mean, some of the things in this manifesto, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the, in the chat, um, uh, Rehearsals have to take place in a conflict zone or performance has to take place in an active conflict zone. We have to have at least four languages on stage at any point in time. There needs to be um, non-professionals and animals. Uh, everything has to be packed into a standard um, uh, freight uh, truck that you don't need a CDL driver's license to move. Um, I mean, nothing can be rehashed um, 
no, no uh, narrative uh, that we can recognize. It has to be completely new and divisive. Like those are impossible things for a national theater to kind of say every single one of our shows is going to be that. But the reach for that, the vision for that tell, tells everybody in that organization from the top down, this is what we're going for. And you're responsible for this. This is in your hands. Um, when you see we're not living up to our vision, our manifesto, you got to say something. So it is a top down uh, vision, but it needs to be a bottom up vision as well. Um, I, I, I've, I've been speaking to a lot of the um, creators of these amazing resource documents uh, and asked why is there not a section for directors or actors? Why have not actors or directors been involved in this process? Why is this, an, why is this seen as only a designer problem to solve? Um, you, you've, got, you've got a lot of us who are just there with you um, and will be seen and will be you know, fronted in front of the audience. And we have no clue or um, invitation into that process as well. So, um, and, and to kind of bring that back around to something that Nadi was talking about, um, it reminded me of um, British American director, John Doyle, who um, whenever he starts a rehearsal process, he asks the stage management production team, I want you to bring every single prop and costume that you have that you can get into this rehearsal room into this rehearsal room and they start with everything they basically start rehearsal in prop storage and as rehearsals go on what an actor doesn't touch gets taken out of the room until they are left with only the things that the actors absolutely necessarily wanted to use and in that process actors start to learn like oh my god if i want to use this thing i better find five or seven other ways in the show to, for this to transform and to become something because I'm going to end up on stage with nothing unless it's necessary. And his shows are nothing if not sexy, I will definitely say that. So involving everybody from the top down with a vision that we can all truly find uh, inspiring and hold each other to, I think that's that's something that we um, need to add in to to make the working procedures, whatever those working procedures afterwards become. Thank you, Adam, um, for for mentioning something that is very important uh, about the invitation uh, authors in the very beginning of the process uh, to be part of the creating the philosophy of eco uh, performance. So I think it is something, you are completely right. It is oriented uh, mostly to the designers or production in general, but uh, not how we are, uh, how we are implementing it in the for general for aesthetic horizon of the of the of the project. So it is something very important to to mention and to uh, advocate for to uh, put this topic at the very beginning of the of the development of the process. Uh, beside that. Um, it is it is something that will be very individual responsibility, which is not the, the solution at the end of the day. So, um, uh, hi on how you see this uh, topic? Um, I'm also talking from a perspective of director or playwright, and sometimes a drama facilitator. And I think this issue is really about how we can um, make this to everybody's responsibilities and our self-interest. It's, it's in um, many problems that I see is that we don't set this uh, issue into our priority in making performance for various reasons, um, like time, money, and also people fear about being failed and people think that they are not experts enough to implement this into their practices. But I think we all have to acknowledge that we just started this conversation. This is a very new conversation and everybody is actively trying to figure out like, how can we do better? So what we need is definitely imagination. How imagine our way of creating imagine our way of making relationships and imagine our way to engage other people like even outside the production 
So it, I think we can start from there where we know that this is very new and we can always fail, but this will be, and also this will be not easy and this will be long-term journey. And I love that how this international network has been very collaborative and supportive to each other. Nobody was um, afraid of sharing their experience or their resource. And I think that's all already very positive. What I see in Korea often is um, at the same time, like people feel that they are not experts enough and where to find the resource and that, and all that limitation kind of also comes from the systemic issues. And because in, in Korea, many funding systems are very short term. There are not many um, funding available that we can practice more than a year. Like everything happens in one year term and that's very exhausting for the artist. And so this conversation should not only stay in the artist, um, but we also need to find a way to talk to our funders, talk to our public organizations, and this should be everybody's responsibility. So it's not really, sometimes it's not really about arts, but it's sometimes it's about politics. It's about our social engagement. So I think it's, Sometimes it feels very difficult where to start and how I can involve more people, especially I'm a theater director. And that um, means like, sometimes I don't uh, practically like uh, directly engage with like my material choices sometimes. Like I always need to talk to people, not the material sometimes. Sorry, it's 5 a.m. talk, but my English brain is not really working perfectly. But so it's it's really about like involving more and more people into discussions is the key, I think. Even when we go for lunch during the rehearsal, like where do we want to go and where do we start the conversation if we get to have a chance to talk to the production or uh, maybe today we can try something vegan. That's already uh, one way to start our uh, making our practice into more sustainable way. It's not always a, it's, it's not always inside the rehearsal room or the theater, but it's, we have to actively um, imagine who we are um, influencing and who we are engaging with our practices. Yes, you're, all of you are completely right, and I think that it is uh, something like an inspiring platform for all of us uh, in the audience and who is part of the network because sharing experience is a very um, valuable uh, thing to do in a sense, in, in, in a scope of something that is let's say new, it is not new in, in, in general, but in the field of culture and art and, and performing arts, it is a new process that we need to push more and more. And um, when we come to that, uh, uh, in terms of, of materials or, or life cycle or how you see possibilities of uh, reusing or circularity or sharing, uh, you know, we already spoke about it in, within the network, but can you share a bit more uh, with the audience your ideas and uh, what are the future of, um, of, of, of that kind of collaborative practices within the performing arts? <laughs> I, I will just start with something which uh, will be might be maybe a little bit different than what others will be thinking from the practical point of view uh, of their performances. I would say in the process of thinking uh, and sorting the materials, don't forget um, that the times are changing and maybe to put more finances into people so they have time and capacity to actually do the research 
to find the second hand or used resources and how and to rethink how they are using the materials and how they can be stored and how can they be used in the future and not being just in the linear like we are getting them we are putting them on stage and then we are throwing them away but uh for that you actually need the people to think about it and work with it and experiment with it so uh maybe invest less in materials and actually more in people uh, in this sense. So it's capacity, capacity creating. And now I will let it for others um, to continue. Yeah, you're completely right. right. This kind of capacity building of, of, uh, of knowledge is a very important thing. And once uh, Ian mentioned something uh, that is very important, that it is not about... Uh, just what we do, but how we do what we do, and, and we need to know, we need to learn, and that's why uh, this panel is uh, has this title, how uh, learn to uh, unlearn uh, the old practices and learn a uh, new one. Um, and so, uh, and also Ian now mentioned something that is important to, to learn how, what is, we are not uh, allowed to do anymore, not just within the performing arts, but in general, so uh, uh, several ideas from that side. So Nadia, you are very into the practice in that sense. So can you yes, absolutely. As a yeah, first of all, I, I just quickly want to uh, thank Adam for, for what you said, and, and also you have one, um, because very often in, in, um, in production, I feel a little bit like the, the police that makes <laughs> makes life a bit uncomfortable. I said, uh, but A, uh, we still have an ecological uh, issue here. And uh, so I'm really glad if other people think with us. Um, no, I, I really think there it, it comes a lot um, in sharing knowledge because on one hand all the workshops they are really uh, they, they are very used to create prototypes yeah but i think to make prototypes with new materials that maybe are like for out of uh, old cardboard or whatever um that needs a lot of time and uh, i think that it's really important to share to share knowledge that you made, like uh, from one prototype, you can always say with, for example, with fungi, if you work with fungi, it's really complicated. It's it's really very, very complicated issue. And if um, if we uh, share knowledge that hey, if you put too much water, then it starts getting dark and black and maybe you have to make it a bit different. And and if you can hand over the knowledge that we, that we got, um, that is a really important thing and to, um, so then like uh, making the prototypes always pushes it a bit further and it also makes it easier to, to get in and to say, okay, even if I'm not an expert, I can start, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I don't have to start from the bottom, but I start from where the other one's, uh, the, the other one's expertise ends and I push it a bit further. I think that is, uh, that is very important. <laughs> Beside, um, beside, yeah, beside, um, like working with funders and and uh, funders, you say that uh, is it right? Huh? If you work with funders, of course, like how do you do it? Do you make it digital so that uh, that um, the the theater that, that you can share the the props you have? Not only uh, the opera house has the props, but the, maybe the smaller places can also profit from it, and and so that again to make visible what is there already. I think that is uh, very important, and and to 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 generate tools for that. Yeah, everything that you mentioned, I think, is important for the further uh, modeling the, the the way of thinking. Uh, and Ian, yeah, um, yeah. because you started with the the um, the prompt sort of towards life cycle and material. And and I think I think you're going to find a lot of agreement here. But but as one practical thing that I've um, that we've started integrating into projects that I've been involved with, and that is uh, just moving. Uh, so this is more of a tip than necessarily like a, a platitude. But um, uh, if you want to change the way that you are relating to material. Um, particularly regarding circularity and avoiding waste. Ask the question of where it's going to go when you 
are planning the project. <laughs> Uh, do that at the beginning. I find, uh, and it seems to be a surprise <laughs> when that, that that gets suggested in in, in uh, some areas. But working with technical directors, builders, carpenters, production managers, oftentimes our consideration of how we're going to um, as no longer use something, whether or not that's into a waste stream or to put it into reuse, happens after something has been a project has been completed and then it's where does it go now that i'm done with it as opposed to if at the very beginning within the planning stages as you're budgeting a show and deciding which materials that you're going to use say where is this going to where's this item where is this material going to go at the end of the project um and then you have the opportunity to say is that does that mean that I am creating something that aligns with my values? Because uh, I want it to be more sustainable. Uh, that that's that uh, that's what I'll throw in there for the life cycle question. Move that question of uh, circularity um, into the beginning because it releases you from the linear time that your your end product is something to be disposed of. Um, so uh, build those relationships with your spaces and materials from the beginning don't wait until um you don't want them around anymore I, yeah can i add to it like i uh encountered a really interesting uh example of this uh in italy where they started to put in a budgeting next to the line of how much the material cost them right next to the cost they wrote they started to write what will be with the material afterwards. And so it started immediately in the budget connect like, oh, we will pay this much for these materials and they are becoming trash because they had to write like trash, recycle, reuse and all that stuff. So it immediately in their heads while they were budgeting before building and anything like saw, oh, like we are actually paying two thirds of the money to go to trash, we are creating trash. And that changed their approach. And uh, so it is exactly what Ian talked about. And uh, I'm happy that this practice is like spreading. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really important insight uh, uh, and uh, something that all of us can use in, in our practices. So uh, thanks for that for both of you. Adam. Yeah, I have I have lots of thoughts. I'm just taking lots of notes here. So this is going to be a little scattered. Um, just things I'm responding to. Uh, we talk about resources all the time. There are human resources as well. And if we could put the money toward the human resources instead of the stuff resources, we'd already be uh, solving this problem. Um, I am coming from this from a director's point of view as, I, as I'm talking about all the time. So I'm always talking about getting more pay for uh, actors and designers and everybody else. And uh, I can do it on a bare stage. Um, we're inspired by each other. Like we go and watch other artists and a turn of phrase, a color, something that we see or hear inspires us and it informs our work. And, and our job as an artist is to make the smooth over the edges of where the theft has happened and it becomes original, right? Um, we are inspired by other things, but for what we're proposing, we have to be inspired by the process or the blueprint. The stuff on stage it look will look beautiful and you can say it's sustainable, but that means nothing to me. I can I can't do anything with that. I don't I have to start over from scratch again. So there's a there's a question, a discussion that needs to be had around intellectual property, about sharing ideas and thoughts. Um and, and, and we've we've a lot of people have started having this conversation, but but as Nadia had said before, like maybe we do see this same window frame in three different productions and then next year we see it in somebody in some other theater company's production as well and you know maybe there's a it, there's a bit of a joke around it in the theater it's, you know industry and the audience is like isn't that the same window from yeah that was the window and that maybe that is but um there's a there's a worry there's a concern and there's a conversation that needs to be had around um how can i how can i use your your work I, 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 the processes that you have created, the things that you have discovered, the, um, the, the, the hard work that you've put into it, 
does it does it just live here? Does it just live with you? Or can we all benefit from that? And how do we how do we compensate you for that? How do we um, uh, credit you for that? And how do we also move forward uh, and let it continue to live? Um, uh, one, two, two other two other points I, I thought of because um, we were talking about failing and not having the the time or the money to fail, um, but we also need to be we, we we should we should work to not try and completely hide our failures either. I think there's something that since the invention of the proscenium, um, we have we have gotten the the wizard behind the curtain and nobody should look behind the curtain to see the wizard is there and. That was great for a long period of time, but like, why are we keeping people from knowing how the sausage is made? What are we gaining by keeping it mis the mystery and the mystique of all the hard work that we do? Um, you know, you bring anybody into the theater who's never been in the theater before and, and, and show them around, all of a sudden they go, oh my God, this is... <laughs> This is a lot. This is a lot of hard work. This is this is amazing how much is going on. How many people are working on this instead of the six actors on stage? That's all they get to see. Um, we need to be able to start peeling back the curtain and showing what it is that we do. And that also means our failures as well, not to be ashamed of them, which brings me to my last point, which is also taking the shame out. Um, I, I think a lot of the hard part of um, uh, being sustainable and just being ecological just in our everyday lives is there's there's shame that comes with it because i can't live up to i can't be 100 percent i can't be vegan but i can be vegetarian sometimes but i can't do it all the time well then you know my vegan friends will shame me or i can't be uh 100 ecological on this thing um and or you know oh you you have a plastic bag that you brought from the grocery store today what's wrong with you like well, I don't want to be around that person anymore. And if we're trying to create an entire team that is that person, um, we should celebrate what we can do. Obviously, hold each other to account. Oh, you're better, you know. Oh, do, do you need a, a a grocery bag that is a you know reusable grocery bag? Here, I'll give you one. It, that's a different way of saying stop using plastic grocery bags. It's just it's just a, a shift of how we talk and work with each other and the audience as well. It's not shameful for you to be here, to have driven here, to sit in an air-conditioned place with a paper pamphlet. It's not shameful for you to do that. We're gonna move away from paper, paper pamphlets. We're going QR. Um, here are all of the uh, uh, metro lines. Here are all the uh, uh, public transportation ways to get here. And here is you know, a car sharing service that we are setting up. We are setting up you know, uh, groups. We wanna introduce people in the audience to each other. Can there be uh, ride shares with each other? I don't know what that is, but it's not about shaming people to change it's about inspiring them to do something different and helping them to find those kind of things so those are the the points that popped up for me thank you adam and um i am i now giving the word to uh, uh Harold and uh, then um uh, shortly to ian and then we are going to the questions from the audience because I'm pretty sure that you will have some. Yeah, well, I think that's you. Oh, <laughs> I, I think I'm kind of, I might be repeating everybody's words, but um, I think it's important to start conversation from the very beginning, which we often forget or often kind of um, think it's not priority but it's really impossible to bring the conversation in the middle of the process or at the almost like end of like right before the performance, everybody get tired of it. So it's really important to bring the issue at the very top of the process and be honest and just start from what we have, start from what we understand and slowly um, extending our understanding and our achievement is always meaningful and as Adam said like I think like shaming might be shaming and the fear is fear of failing have, have been the top issues I think um, and it's not only about like 
uh, changing the materials that we've been using. It's not really about like making dramatical changes, but I think it's as uh, Ian said like before, it's a cultural change. It's a cultural practice that we need to, we really need to work on. So like just sharing our values is already very important because more than we think, like not many people talk about climate issues that much actually. And we all worries about our planet now it became very common to worry about climate crisis, but actually we don't really talk about it because yeah, like if we talk about veganism, like maybe some people will feel difficult, like maybe I'm gonna offend somebody, but actually if we start like talking about where we are, that's already opening so many possibilities. And it's not only inside the production. Like when you go for lunch during the rehearsal, like talk to the people working in the restaurant, like we're doing this and then we can actually invite more than we, uh, more people than we imagine. And also like celebrating small achievement is very important. It's, it's not about like, we can start everything in the bare stage, like let's use some, new materials like so it be, let's be inventive it's not only about that but even like small achievement need to be celebrated that help us keep going uh super yeah is it possible to uh, uh give the floor to the audience and then in incorporate your reflection into the answer that you will give when... sure i would it, it's uh five minutes though just to Try to merge these two things. I will. I. I will. I. I will. I can. I can attach it to any answer that I that I give to an audience question. That's fine. And uh, I'm really happy that we are now mentioning the human resources also as a maybe dominant part of the transformative uh, policies within the sector. So not just to think through the materials and. Uh, and uh, and that kind of uh, 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 yeah materials that are that are important components of the the, the creating process, but but uh, to give opportunity for the larger education, cooperation, networking, uh, building the knowledge, and things like that that are be the, in the center of the further discussion on this topic. Uh, and when we come to discussion, I'm giving the floor to the audience. And um, do we have questions? Yes, we can. Uh -huh. Can you just bring the mic? Okay. Okay, hello. My name is Zulia. Thank you for this wonderful panel discussion. Um, I have a question. Perhaps um, I would start uh, and ask Adam. Um, would you equalize um, green theater, uh, planet positive theater, because this was the majority of the discussion, with a sustainable theater? Or there are equally pressing methods in terms of making theater more sustainable, uh, in addition to these green topics. I'm I'm not sure who that was for. I didn't quite hear that. It was a it's a bit uh, yeah. We're all kind of a bit echoey here on the call. Oh really? Uh, I feel like it might have been for you, Adam. I heard you. Yeah, it was for you, Adam. <laughs> I heard my name, but then I didn't hear anything <laughs> else afterwards. Uh, the difference, uh, the difference. But if I'm, if I'm sorry, uh, you can reiterate it. But um, uh, e equating green theater and sustainable theater, and whether or not these are the 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 same initiative, or there's a differentiation to be made between between those those things. 
I have thoughts on it, but I'll, I'll let you answer first because you were, oh, no, you were no, name no, checked. <laughs> Why was I name checked? Um, <laughs> the difference between green theater and sustainable theater. I actually asked you because you were talking about people agenda, like uh, sustainability in terms of human resourcing, funding, etc. So. What makes theater sustainable, yeah? Uh, in addition to green agenda. Misha, you're about to say, I heard that actually wonder because it feels like what you said at the very beginning, Misha. Yeah, like um it's um it's the understanding of what sustainability is. Like imagine sustainability is roof and it's standing on three pillars, and that's economic, social, and environmental. So the sustainability, like this umbrella is the roof. If, and if you push just like one of the pillars, the roof will fall. Like it will not really, it will be not stable. So um, green theater, green initiative are part of the sustainability initiative. That's how I perceive it. And uh, so it is, subgroup like green theater is subgroup of the sustainability like it belongs into it it is not equal or higher it it belongs to it it's a uh, it's one I, yeah. I would say like from this point of view maybe i can try to also add some thoughts about it as a, as a culture as a fourth pillar we need and uh, and then we when we are talking about the culture as a fourth pillar it is some not just the uh, sub uh, uh, topic, but also the topic which is uh, in parallel dialogue, but also uh, within the sustainable goal, uh, sustainable sustainability goals that we have with, uh, in front of us. Uh, this, uh, which is oriented towards climate and others, is just one of seventeen of them. So, uh, what uh, today we are talking about eco sustainability. So that's why we were focused on it. But when we uh, talk about the sustainability, it can be uh, open on different uh, perspectives, different uh, inclusions and uh, other social things which are also, also important for the society. Yeah. Um, do we have some other reflection? I have a question. I think we also had one question on Zoom, so maybe we can address that as well. But I will start. I'm Diana from Green Arts Incubator, so we all know each other via email. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts. It was very inspiring. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I see that Adam is holding his headphones. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so I have a question uh, for you because the majority of you come from the academic background and you work with young people and students. So what do you think is the best approach in inspiring young theater makers to embed sustainability in terms of ecological sustainability in their practice, but not making it like one piece, one prototype, but really making that as a way of thinking in their practice in general? I'm happy to, I, I, yeah, I think we're just looking into there. It will give me a chance to sneak in all the other things that I wrote down from the previous thing. Too. Um, uh, well, one, I think that, uh, and, and having been specifically teaching in this arena now for over, over 10 years, I've also seen just a shift in the students that we're working with, that all of the students that I work with now, um, uh, concern for the climate is something that has never not existed for them like uh, i'm now working with students who uh could not speak when i uh, i started getting involved with sustainability work in in theater i don't think i've got to the point where they, they maybe weren't born yet but it's just it's not that far off um so i think that that part of that is there and i think so much of 
what we're talking about is taking, and, and this goes not just for sustainability um, and ecological concerns. Well, it, it's all sustainability actually, but not just ecological concerns as we're saying, but also the social, the economic, the entire like picture of as as was indicated in the in the sustainable development goals of the of the systems that we work in and the values that we have as uh, society, civilization, how how grand you want to be at it, but like those social connections um, are all like, how do we express those in the type of work that we're wanting to be doing? And I know the students that I work with now are not willing to put their values aside for the type of work that they want to be creating. So in many ways, uh, it's not something that I'm doing. It's that we are coming onto the same page because they are they, they're there for it already and i think that where they're not part of that is enabling even even you know when i started doing this work even before the the cspa and there were um there was uh, or is a scenic shop in outside of new york city showman fabricators um and they instituted uh, a number of different uh, uh sustainability initiatives where they you know, they'd, they'd offer to build things and more with greener practices that have materials libraries that are very early on, they take back any, any of the sets that they build, et cetera. They do a lot of interiors. So they have uh, lead certified um, accredited professionals on staff, et cetera. Many things that are, that are going, that are going on. And one of the things that they found when they started implementing these changes is that many of their staff were like leaving their values at the door when they came in because they're like, this is my job versus this is my life. And so they do lots of things. They, 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 they were cyclists. They were already streaming waste. They were concerned about these things. They were, they were thinking about other people um, and issues that come up in theater or in art in general, like that function of, of, of being critical with that, like they were part of that. So it was important to them individually and sort of built this this differentiation between our individual values and those like related to employment and whether or not we have agency there a lot of our just like structures for these like the the business side of arts don't may, haven't made room for those in the past so i think um my experience has just been about making room for that and encouraging students to lean into those 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 value systems that they hold for the things that are important to them and figure out how to both express those through the work but also how that can change the way that they're making the work and that leads to to i think really um inventive ways i mean that's where i've seen like this idea of well you know i don't want to throw this out so let's come up with a planning process that's that that's there uh, that that considers that early on, like what are my impacts for doing this, and how might I want to do this differently? Um, and if you get to them really early <laughs> in that training phase when they've got time and it's about process, uh, one they don't know that it needs to be different because no one has like told them that they can't do it that way. And now that I've been I, I've been in my current academic post for now, uh, this is my. 11th or 12th year. Um, I have uh, students that I was working with when I st uh, when I started in this position who are now seeing rise into upper levels. And so like we're just seeing uh, like that agency and them being given agency with organizationally to be able to do that. So <clears throat> I think just supporting them in integrating their values into their professional life uh, has been it's a lot easier, actually, <laughs> than than I thought it would be. No, yes, I didn't get to sneak in the other parts. Thank you so much uh, for that. I think it's really beautifully put to emphasize the values because uh, I think some of us sometimes forget that we are the creators of certain values. So uh, thank you so much for this reflection. So I will give floor to Yovana now because we don't have much time. We have to follow agenda, but thank you so much. And I think that we have a question on Zoom also. Um, you'll see uh, coming in. Uh, yeah. This is directly related to what I snuck in there too. Okay. Cool. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't mean to I monopolize time, but but may I? Yeah. Um. So uh, this is super interesting. I like I can't provide a specific example of directly using a theater drop or sets within uh, street art, and a lot of it has to do with this question of intellectual property. And I got excited about and writing notes about this because um I'm chair of the Green Committee for our Stage Design Union in Canada. Um, and this is actually something that we're working on right now is um, we have recently strengthened the intellectual property protections for our members, for our union members, the stage designers, uh, in our standard contracts with our theater organizations for that. Um, because that is, you know, as long as they're contractors, that's where their their value, where their work is. So that, that makes sense. But even though we've strengthened that language, we've wanted to make sure that we articulate that is not meant to mean that you can't that as a foil to reuse we would like people to be reusing things so what we're working with now um through a, a few a couple of intersecting projects but internally around building addendums and writers where we're giving uh working with designers to come up with the tools by which they can articulate the things that are protected because what we have found is that um there are ip considerations but because nobody in theater in particular, has money. Um, there's been no legal test um, of that. So um, I, I sometimes refer to IP as the last boogeyman that that people are avoiding sustainable action with, in in, in at least here in North America, um, because you get to all those things. We want to do it, but we can't do it because the designer's intellectual property. And there are there are boundaries to that of when it becomes. But that gray space has never been articulated. Um, so we're working on making it so the designers can explicitly say, yes, you can reuse this. No, you can't reuse this. Because if you extend the idea that you can't reuse anything that appeared on this stage, then if you buy a costume piece or you're using a wheelchair, then you're like, well, what about the intellectual property that you've just like, the per things that you've purchased for the show? So that's an invalid argument to begin with. Um, it is something that because there hasn't been uh, really a legal test of like finding where those boundaries are for any place that is based off of precedent, at least, that it is the World Intellectual Property Organization is trying to convene um, stage designers. In, it was supposed to happen in November. It got pushed back, I think, to February in Geneva to have li uh, designers who work in um, uh, or people related to live performance and living arts uh, come together to talk about intellectual property and getting more specific with it, uh, specifically around this idea of um, it's it's you know it traps things um, from being used again. So there are IP. So to answer the question in the, in the Zoom, which for those who may not have heard it, is around whether or not um, street artists using theater drops and sets. Uh, yes, actually, Misha, I would say that this would be like the material auction in Prague. Misha and I have worked on getting this to happen in Prague after the PQ since 2011, of trying to just get local artists to be aware of that scenic material that's coming out of that festival after 10 days. Um, and they've brought it in-house as well. I wouldn't identify a clearinghouse except for community ones. So like uh, uh, Nadia has put those together. We have in Canada, we have a few different groups that, that help to to manage reuse materials and we're looking at that and then there is this question of we're trying to at least in our context here in Canada um, uh, solve these IP questions or at least come to something that doesn't prevent us from reuse more readily. Just okay. quickly, can yeah, I yeah, add? Yeah, just quickly yeah, to, to add. I, I just think it's really nice what you said about uh, the, the in, uh, intellectual property, and that is really important, but also that we have to develop tools uh, where, uh, for example, street artists can see what there is, what, what there is in theaters, so um, or what material there is that they have left over. So uh, that is really uh, something important, but these are tools that we have to work on. Okay, thank you. And um... <laughs> no, it's not important. No, it is. Uh, we, we can answer shortly, I guess, on one more question. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you and your guests for this panel. It, it, it was really important. Uh, and my question is Are you, as a theater makers, uh, are willing to advocacy for a reduction of theater production at the global level? And do you think that is the one of the solutions? Who would like to answer? Giovanna, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, uh, do you see uh, uh, you as a theater makers? Do you see your position as a position for advocating uh, of reducing the uh, theater uh, pr productions around the globe uh, and uh, make it like one of the solutions of the problem? Mm -hmm. Nadia, Misha. No. I just, I just really think that that's what everybody is wishing for, <laughs> like to have uh, to work longer on less productions, and uh, I think it's uh, maybe something Misha can be better uh, talk about because I think from from all the people in theatre, it's it's too many productions, too fast, uh, and and um, we all don't want that. <laughs> I think it's really an economic, as a it's an economical problem, and uh, it's a political problem. Mm -hmm. Misha, do you want to? Yeah, like um, there is a also important thing um, to mention, and there is a difference between overproduction and reducing production, because overproduction and like doing more, like doing more and more and more and faster. It's in theater. It's in a movie. It's in audiovisual uh, industry and everywhere. So, and we are not like saying let's stop creating that's not about it it's just like let's not overproduce like humans can only take in so much so let's take this in consideration let's take in a consideration the quality the time and everything we put in it and this is a bigger question and it could be completely different panel for two weeks we could talk about and that is uh also like the grant system which exists in certain like countries like here in czech uh the theaters when they are giving uh when they are given a grant for creation uh for for a year they have to they have to produce we saw it during COVID. they had to produce the place even though they were never premiered publicly because it the theaters were closed so they were rehearsing and premiering inside of the theater for the empty theater, just because they had to produce because it was in the contract of the grant. And that is the thing I'm talking about, like uh, this is waste and this is overproducing. So even the financial uh, subsidy and the policy and the politics about it, uh, there should be talks uh, about how we support the art. Do we support theater only? when they are making four premieres a year? Is a theater which is making one premiere a year or none invalid? Like this is a huge question and we could, if we open it, we will spend another day here, <laughs> I think. Yeah, but it is it is a good uh, uh, starting point for, for yeah. new conversations. Uh, uh, so I would like to thank you uh, personally and as a colleague for your efforts that you are giving all of you to this topic in your in your practical and professional and academic world. And uh, I would like also to propose uh, more uh, talks like this and uh, to. Uh, network in a wider sense and also uh, thanks for all the, uh, the collaborations that we already, already doing in the, our network and uh, also thanks to the audience that uh, was with us and uh, uh, follow all these uh, uh, topics that are important for, for the development of the, of the changes that uh, we need to as, as we mentioned uh, several times to put in a framework of culture shift in general, uh, and to think uh, uh, through the co collectively thinking how we can 
uh, transform what we do. And um, uh, yes, we are now uh, we are now going to uh, the session in in uh, live here in, at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts. For us, it, it is also important because we are now uh, uh, working on our protocols and working procedures, curriculums, and things that are. Um, important for our students, not, not just in a sense of production, but also value. So I'm really uh, uh, hope that we will be in position to to speak uh, more in the future with them uh, about this on on, on your uh, case studies and practices that you are working on. Thanks again. Thanks uh, for the audience here in in SBA and uh, uh, until next uh, seeing. Have a nice uh, period. Hi. I said the uh, information is the public, or what? I'm so the media. Okay. Bye. It was great to meet you all. Good. <laughs>